I'd like to um, present our guest speaker, Mr. Close Roberts, who was kind enough to donate the original plaque, this original plaque that was on Main Street. Now, anybody who's traveling on Main Street, um, traveling towards Morristown, it'll be on the right side, right next to the PSEMG um, mm -hmm. area. Uh, the entrance and exit to Route 73, and it sits on a, a little little mound. And this this is the original part. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Mr. Foster Roberts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Betty and ladies and gentlemen. I like to introduce the. Uh, a gal whose father tended this thing for many years. He did all the, kept the letters legible with black paint. Polly Roberts Adams. I like <laughs> <laughs> Betty said I would be uh, talking about the real early history when they first came over. Well, my memory doesn't go back any further than 1875. So I'll have to start that. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I usually like to put my best side towards the camera, <laughs> but I'd rather face you. <laughs> but I'm going to try to skew my back. Well, when you I'm going to try to give you an idea. Sit in the chair. Okay. You don't have to stand. Yeah. I'll try to give you an idea of what it would have been like to have lived circa 1875. Now, we've all seen what it looked like, pictures, movies, television. But there was something that was very much a part of uh, living at that time that doesn't come across on the screen, and that is the smell. There were animals everywhere. Horses were the main means of transportation. So there were horses on the road and in the towns and in the city. So there was manure in the towns and in the cities and, and in the streets. I had a great aunt who died in 1976 at the age of 100. And I had asked her what Philadelphia smelled like at the turn of the century. Well, she was a lady, lady of real dignity, and I don't think the word manure was in her vocabulary. <laughs> she said it was an earthy smell. <laughs> well, I'm sure there were many who'd rather not be exposed to it. In fact, uh, some ladies would carry a thing of perfume to sniff on occasion to obscure it. But generally, they expected it and accepted it, and that's the way it was. Not only that, there were outhouses, privies everywhere. Now, all of the row houses in Philadelphia have small backyards, and that's where the privies were. From the street, you'd see a row of houses. In the back, you'd see a row of privies. The houses were close together, and so were the privies. Also, people smell. Now, not many could be so fastidious as to expect to take a bath every day. Once a week was the norm. Well, for many, it was much less frequently than that. Because it wasn't easy to take a bath. The water had to be cool uh, carried from wherever the well was. Uh, pump, uh, towns had their town pumps, and one pump would supply a number of families. Farms had their own wells, but the pump might be more convenient to the barn than to the house, and the water all had to be heated on the stove, so it wasn't very abundant. So frequently, the whole family would bathe in the same tub of water. Well, maybe not all of them. Some were sewed into their underwear for the winter. They couldn't bathe at all. <laughs> when I was around, there was another kid around, the son of one of the men on the farm named Buddy Scott. And he had his own distinctive odor. I had a keen nose, and Mother said at the supper table one night, when the windows were open, I announced that I smelled Buddy Scott. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't visible at the time, but he soon came into view. I can't recall the fragrance, but if I ever <laughs> smell it again, I'll recognize it. <laughs> I look around for Buddy Scott. <laughs> but I'd rather smell manure. Now, manure naturally accumulated wherever horses were kept and accumulated in the city. And in 1900, there were so many horses in the five boroughs of New York City, they produced 20,000 tons of pollution a day. And that ain't hay. Mm -hmm. Now, people who didn't leave the city, and some of them didn't in their entire lifetime, never smelled fresh air. Well, the manure was important plant food and fertilizer. Farmers are anxious to buy it. So every year, the city of Philadelphia would put the manure in its firehouses up for sale, public bid. And that's where my great-grandfather came in. <clears throat> he was a farmer, and I guess he bid on it every year. And he usually won the bid for all of the firehouses in the city. In 1875, he paid 70 cents per month per horse, 76.50 cents, 77.40 cents per month per horse. 
the economy was on the downside. And he would sublet sections of the city to other farmers. One farmer got those west of the school field, another one got those south of Market Street. Several other farmers got a few. And he kept the rest for himself that I assume would be near the ferry and near, near Dock Street, produce market. But since the uh, wagons, and he often had several on the road at night, would take a uh, take in a load of produce, bring back a load of manure. Imagine doing that now. But those wagons, they were called market wagons or truck shelvings, and any farmer who grew produce would have at least one. They were one of the few vehicles that were frequently driven by somebody who was sound asleep. They came back late at night and the driver slept on the way home. The, the horses often knew, knew the way. A horse will naturally follow a route that he's familiar with. And that was something that a young man who was courting more than one young lady had to keep in mind. <laughs> while his buggy was carrying one young lady in his buggy, in, while he's carrying one young lady in his buggy, his buggy could force my turn into the driveway of another. Well, it's not really fair to my great grandfather to introduce him in this matter. Fine manure wasn't his claim to fame. Well, it seemed may seem inappropriate for me to have dwelt on this subject at such an extent, but it was a uh, <clears throat> it was something all through history until relatively recently. That cannot be ignored. But I've said about enough about manure, so I won't mention it again. <laughs> well, my great-grandfather was Emma Roberts. My father was named for him. And he lived from 19, 1831 to 1980. After a couple of years as a student at a school for boys in Alexandria, Virginia, he spent a couple of years teaching there. Then he returned to the family farm. And he was quite a man. He was involved in many things. He was a member of the Board of Managers of Swarthmore College for many years. That's a Quaker school still there near Westchester. He was on the board of the National State Bank of Camden for over 34 years. He was also a surveyor. He settled estates for people. He was clerk of the kind of thing a lawyer would do now. He was clerk of Philadelphia Yearly Meeting for 15 years. That's the highest office in the Religious Society of Friends, Quaker. But his favorite occupation was farming. And he farmed what was later called the home farm on Church Road in Mount Laurel Township, where a Grandmawood Country Club is now. He was the fourth son of eight children, and it's unusual for the fourth son to be the one to take on the family farm. He usually went to the oldest. But the oldest had decided to farm elsewhere, and the next two sons died as children before Emma was born. We're told they died from eating green pears from a tree in the front yard. Families were large then. Many of the children didn't live in maturity. There were some real hardy families. A, a lady who died in the 1790s near Flemington, and she left 17 children, 130 grandchildren, and 100 great-grandchildren. That wasn't the family you casually invited to dinner. Yeah. <laughs> well, Emmer married Martha Lippincott. They had four children, all lived in maturity. The youngest was Walter, who was four in 1875. The next came Horace, who was seven. He was my grandfather, the only one to become a farmer. And uh, he had several farms, and he owned farms, uh, had farms around Maple Shade, and some of them were where Barlow sold the uh, uh, home zone. <coughs> he, he, had another, he had a daughter, Alice, who was going to a Quaker school in Philadelphia. His oldest child was his son, Israel, who in 1875, 76, and 77 was attending Swarthmore College. And Emma wrote Israel about every week. And somehow those letters have survived, and it's through those letters that we learn about my great-grandfather, and especially about the times in which he lived. We learn about transportation. I've already mentioned the horse, but I like to emphasize the importance of the horse through the ages. Without the horse or a beast of burden, people would have to walk, have to live within walking distance of the food source. And I don't mean the supermarket, there weren't any, but within uh, walking distance of the land where the crops, the produce, the animals were raised. And have you ever thought how difficult it would have been to settle this country without the horse? That faithful and obedient creature who was willing to submit to the will of a person and pull the plow, deliver the goods, deliver transport people anywhere in all kinds of weather. We are really indebted to the horse. And there are all kinds of stories of the risks of buying a horse from a Quaker. The late mayor of Medford, Eve Thomason, told about a man, a man who was looking at a horse that Quaker had for sale Quaker told him he would be pleased to see him run. So he bought the horse. A couple of days later he came back and said, I can't get him to run. 
The Quaker said, I told you they would be pleased to see him run. <laughs> While I'm telling Quaker stories, you want to hear another one. <laughs> you know, the Quakers are nonviolent. And a Quaker came on a burglar in his house. He pointed a shotgun at him and said, I don't want to alarm thee, friend, but thee is standing where I'm about to shoot. <laughs> <laughs> Water travel was important. And the only way to get to Philadelphia from Camden was by ferry. It would be half a century before there'd be a bridge across the Delaware there. And a lot of local freight was carried on the water. In one letter he mentions a line boat being docked at Fork Landing, and farmers would take their wagons or teams to the boat and buy the line right off the boat. In the winter of 1871-72, he was negotiating with Walton Wine and Company to buy some potash salt for fertilizer. <clears throat> and there, there was a problem that winter. The Delaware was frozen over, completely impassable, and that caused an interesting exchange of letters. And Mr. Busby was writing for the company. Well, uh, Walton Wine Company's plant was in Wilmington. They shipped their product up the river to the shore on the wharf in Philadelphia. Mr. Busby, now he was either a Quaker himself or he used Quaker language when uh, doing business with the Quaker. That happened sometimes. In February 1872, he wrote, Dear friend, Owing to the ice, it is impossible to get the potash salt by water from Wilmington at present. It will cost us far more than all the profit to bring it by rail and the cartridge from the depot to our place. Still, if thee needs it before breakup, it shall come that way without regard to expense. He's very obliging. The line of propellers, now he's distinguishing propeller-driven vessels from side-wheelers, third-wheelers that would be useless in the ice. Between here and Wilmington, <coughs> will start the earliest possible day they can force a passage through the ice, and it shall come by the first boat. I will advise thee of that fact if thee can wait till then. The letter ends, closes, truly thine and Busby. Now, truly thine would be the Quaker equivalent of yours truly, a proper closing for a business letter, but it does sound particularly endearing. Well, ever agreed to wait, a letter from Mr. Busby 11 days later says, my letter from Wilmington this morning says Robert's potash salt shipped today. 55 sacks, 10,410 pounds. It will no doubt reach here sometime today and will be in our store ready for thy teams at any time thereafter. Now 10,410 pounds and 55 sacks average is 189 pounds per sack. A man would want to eat a pretty good breakfast before him again. <laughs> Well, you know, this really wasn't a whole lot of fertilizer, a little over five tons. And, but all the correspondence and all the handling of this, those bags are going to be picked up and down a good many times. And today, often today, you can order a load of 20 tons and have it delivered in your yard tomorrow morning. <coughs> there were trains, quite a few, circa 1875, especially in the east. And there were what Emmer called the cars, trolleys, horse drawn at that time, went right down the main street of Mount Holly, Morristown, Maple Shade, on down to the ferry and camp. And he commented on how nice they were in bad weather. Well, if you lived too far to walk through the trolley, you needed a horse. If you didn't have a horse, and most working people could not afford a horse, there was the stage. How plentiful they were, I don't know. He mentioned them several times. Of course, the stage is simply a small horse-drawn bus. <coughs> but a stage coach loses some of its glamour when you think of it as a bus. <clears throat> well, farms were too remote for any kind of public transportation, so anybody who worked on a farm had to live on a farm. And in 1875, more than half the population lived on farms. A married man with a family uh, employed on a farm would be supplied with a house, a tenant house, and usually products from the farm and a source of firewood. A single man lived in a boarding house, but they didn't call it a boarding house, and they didn't call, they didn't pay board. They lived in the main farmhouse with the farmer and his family. They usually took their meals at the table of the family. My mother grew up in a, on a farm, and, and they had help living in. And single men slept in the room behind hers, and their only access was a flight of stairs to the floor below. And every morning, her father would wake them up, four or five o'clock, they had cows enough. And he would go into her room and knock on the wall between her room and theirs, call each one man by name until he answered. Of course, she was awake then, too, and that went on for years. Well, the house I live in was, was made to, for housing help. And single men lived in the attic, in the back of the second floor, a nice-sized room, a couple of small rooms, a man and his wife and a couple of children could live. The man worked on the farm, the wife helped in the, in the kitchen. 
But that was the only reason that the houses were built so large then. Why they're building them so large now, I don't know. <laughs> well, um, Emma and Martha had help living in their house, and they had to be at least 12 in their household. And it was Martha's responsibility to provide the meals, to do the housework, do all the laundry, and all the other things. She had two girls to help her who also lived in. There were many chores that had to be done that don't exist today. There were chamber pots and wash basins to be emptied and cleaned, wash water pitchers and kerosene lamps to be filled. The heat was from a wood stove and just the rooms were heated. Many uh, bedrooms, especially bedrooms, weren't heated at all. They were chill, there were chilly corners, so they used bed warmers and foot warmers. The heat of summer had to be endured. Of course, there was no electricity, there was no air conditioning, and the only fan was one that you waved in front of your face. So people who suffered from the heat, uh, summer was an ordeal. My grandmother, the heat bothered her, and she said she couldn't imagine anything worse than living through a hot summer than dying in the fall. <laughs> Most of the food was grown on the farm. They spent their summer's canning, and they worked hard. And one letter he mentions killing hogs the day before, and he spent the morning cutting them up and salting and curing them. And all that time, Martha and her two girls and as many of the men as she could handle were doing all the other things that had to be done. And that evening, and this was the evening of the second day, they were still making scrapple. How many of you know what scrapple is? Raise your hand. The further you get away from Philadelphia, the fewer people know. But it's a wonderful gourmet food. <laughs> <laughs> One of the young men that lived with him, David Brown, uh, they seemed to be especially fond of him. He left a time or two to drive a team for a traveling circus, but they always seemed to take him back. He had a drinking problem, and uh, Amber wished he would join the Temperance Society. But he often played with little boys, Walter and Horace, in the evening. And one evening, one of the other men was teaching them how to dance. We were teaching uh, David how to dance. But the little boys were learning how to dance, too. Well, Emmer was concerned about that. He rather they didn't learn to dance or uh, develop a fondness for that kind of entertainment. And Cherry's concerned with Israel and wrote, I like the men to be about home in the evening and like to enjoy like them to enjoy themselves and be as happy as possible, and even like to hear the mouth organ. But he was concerned about their influence and said, Upon a farm, persons of all characters, and many without any characters at all, are employed. And our children are thrown into their company and under their influence. But then life is before us, and sooner or later, all persons who do business with the world have to see it as it is. And some of my friends think it is just as well for the children to see it in its true light while they are with and under the direction of their parents. Now, I always lived on a farm. We didn't have help living in, but we, 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 had, uh, we had iron men. And they would assemble at the barn in the morning and then after lunch, and I, I spent a lot of time there. And I heard a neat word down there one day. I didn't know what it meant, but at the first opportunity at the supper table, I used it, and I had my mouth washed out with soap. <laughs> <laughs> that qualified me for Bible school, that <laughs> Well, David's drinking became more of a problem, and there were, he often drove a, a, a load of produce in Philadelphia, and there were times when Emma wouldn't send him out with a load. But I guess uh, he misjudged the situation one time and sent him to Philadelphia with a load of produce. And there's a note from the commission man who sold the, the stuff in there saying David was greatly intoxicated and he was no shape to, to drive a team. So he sent his man to drive David and the team home through the city, across the ferry, and the team could get David home from there. On another occasion, one of the men who lived in the farm spent the day at the cider mill. And he stayed up all night with the jug he brought back with him. In the morning, he was ready to fight, which he did, with the first man to come downstairs. And Ember was called to put a stop to it. It was probably the first, the only time the men saw their boss in his nightclub. <coughs> they, uh, but uh, things beyond their control uh, could occur in, in their home. They couldn't expect a privacy that he takes for granted now. Well, that man uh, had breakfast with him, same as usual, and he skipped out real quick, fearing he'd be sent to Nahali, which of course meant jail. They got a note from him a couple of days later to put his belongings on a stage for Philadelphia, which they gladly did. A working man would not have many possessions. He'd have the clothes on his back, maybe a mouth organ, but he wouldn't have much else. And I've often thought, for the longest time, a working person couldn't afford a watch or any kind of timepiece. 
And now you can buy a watch. It won't be fancy. But it'll keep excellent time for less than one hour at minimum wage. <clears throat> we learn about schooling from these rabbits. Now, Walter was too young to go to school, so he was being uh, given lessons at home. At the time he was five, he could make figures. He could add and subtract. He could count to 100. And he was making progress in multiplication tables. Horace was going to a one-room schoolhouse in fellowship about a mile away to which he walked. And there were a number of classes in that one room, and one teacher taught all the classes, as well as being the janitor and tending the fire. A letter written in February 1876 says, We had no school in fellowship. The teacher left without notice. So Emma was on the school board, so he was looking for a replacement. A letter a month later said, We have a new teacher, Jessie Lippincott's daughter, Anna, and she has her hands full. Israel's report cards from Swarthmore were sent home to his parents, and they would look them over and then send them on to him. And that provided an opportunity for parental advice to seldom escape them. So he wrote, We received our report about last seventh day evening. Now, Quaker's not so much anymore. He uh, used the day of the week and the month by number. Sunday's first day, seventh day is Saturday. was very sorry to see. That's star mark 16. Now, I don't know what that means, but it doesn't sound good. <laughs> and a branch we had supposed he could readily master with reasonable effort. Did not understand why they received it, but I'm inclined to think that perhaps they may not have been as careful and as studious as he should have been. I am very anxious that thee should honestly endeavor to do thy best as regards thy studies and as regards thy deportment and moral walk. The aim of thy parents is to give thee the best opportunities in their power. It is for thee to use and improve them, and in the manner thee will perform thy part, he can but feel the great solicitude. Pretty good words for a student to hear. There was another friend school in near Malton called the Brick School, and this, this was earlier. And in 1794, they printed up a list of rules for the students to follow. The first one was, be at school at the hour appointed with faces and hands washed and heads combed. And there's quite a list of them, and the ninth one is, not only avoid committing any indecent behavior or such amusements as are rude, dirty, or dangerous to yourselves, but shun the pernicious company and conversation of those who are accustomed thereto, especially the shameful and exceedingly sinful practices of lying and swearing, considering you are always in his presence who made you, and notices all your words and actions. There were also articles to be observed by the trustees, the teachers, and those who sent the kids to the school. <clears throat> uh, and there's quite a list of the hours that were open I, I won't read but they scheduled school for every month of the year except August and for a good part of the daylight hours the third one was the teachers and trustees shall provide good firewood paper quills and ink and once in each quarter assess every scholar's proportion of the expense who may use the same or be benefited thereby they charge tuition I don't know what it was in the 1890s, but in the 1830s, 30s, it was $2 per quarter. Mm. And they were only charged for the time they're actually there. Many, many farm boys would be asking for a, a, a good bet during the busy season. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, this 1876 was the year of the, of the centennial in Philadelphia. Uh, I, I just want to tell you about the one man who had a display there, a man named Boynton, who made saws in Newark. And uh, he, he, of course, he was advocating the use of saws over axes. He made saws. But he said that the uh, axes waste a lot more material. And he said the, the value of the material saved by using saws would be enough to pay the interest on the national debt. What time to change. <coughs> they... Uh, they attended <coughs> friends' meeting, Quaker meeting in Morristown. Descendants of descendants, many of them still do. For many farmers, even today, Thanksgiving has a significant, real significant. If the harvest season, harvest is over by Thanksgiving, it soon will be. And the harvest season is a busy, has a hectic time. So when the harvest is over, it's a time to be thankful. And there being many farmers in the meeting at that time, there were many for whom Thanksgiving was special. So in a letter written on Thanksgiving in 1876 in which he mentioned going to meeting that morning, we learned that they had meeting for worship on Thanksgiving. The letter ends, we are all quite well, and he always mentions health of the family, the men, the neighbors. 
Any illness could be serious. Health was fabulous. We are all quite well for the witch and for many of the blessings. We feel this Thanksgiving Day very thankful. A lot of these letters was about farming, the things going on every day. And I have a list here of 37 items that they grew and they sold. Some of them I've already heard of. He describes the prices at the time as being wondrous low. From a couple of letters, it's obvious that uh, Israel wants a new pair of ice skates that sold the, the cost $8. Well, it happens that a three mule load of cabbage was bringing $8. So Emmer said, do you think of that when he uses those skates? It took a three mule load of patents to pay for it. <coughs> Several times a year he went to what he called the grove yard, stockyards in Camden, to buy stock for himself and his neighbors and a local butcher. <coughs> and a letter written the eleventh the eighth of November eighteen seventy six, this was a Wednesday, the day after presidential election, written from the Continental Hotel in Philadelphia. He wrote, I have spent a very busy day, left home this morning at four o'clock, and drove to Camden, then to the drove yards, and got a lot of cattle that I bought on second day, eleven steers weighing a thousand fifty each, and about four cents per pound. The man I engaged to bring them up, that would be a man who would drive them home for him, got drunk, so they didn't get delivered. So last evening I went down and found them as I left them, had them locked up, and this morning I drove them myself through the city and up to the Ellisburg Road, leaving David Brown to take them home. Now, he's casually mentioning this, but there's, there's one man on foot driving a herd of cattle through the streets of the city. It happened all the time. I don't think often by a man who was wearing a suit and ties. I'm sure he was. But there was often cattle in the street. I promised I wouldn't mention manure again, so I won't mention it. <laughs> Since then, I have attended the business in Camden and collected dividends for my friends from most of the city banks <coughs> and done a lot of chores besides. We are all well and still entertain, and entertain at least the shadow of a hope that Hayes may have been elected, though the odds are vastly in favor of Tilden. Well, of course, we know that Hayes was elected. Well, so it is. As I write, I hear in the street, streets what reminds me wonderfully of the rebel yell. Now, this wasn't much after but much more than 10 years after the end of the Civil War. Why the rebel yell appealed to him, I don't know. If there were hospitals, and I'm sure there were, but we don't learn about them from these letters. The ill were treated in their homes. Women gave birth in their homes. People died in their homes. Although he mentions illnesses many times, he only mentions doctors three times. One time, one of these men, Thomas Cunningham, was out with an infected hand for a couple weeks, and he went to the black doctor, who would be Medford's... Uh, Dr. Jane Still, the famous black doctor of the time. If there was illness in the family of one of the men, well, Martha would give what help she could. And Emma writes, We are right well, though they have the scarlet rash, which I assume is scarlet fever, of Thomas Cunningham. And as Martha is frequently there, and the interchange between the families is constant, I feel that we are no small, small risk of getting it, but I trust not. They felt a real responsibility to the people would even risk exposure to illness themselves to help with the care. Now, my grandfather, on my mother's side, now this was a generation later, but it wasn't much different. Uh, he was Samuel Coles. I was named for him. He had a farm in Colestown on Whiskey Road. Some of you know what Whiskey Road is called now? Chapel Avenue. Mm -hmm. Well, he really, he loved horses. He loved machinery too, but he was very fond of horses. And nobody abused the horse or anything, for that matter, in his presence. Well, Mother said one day one of the men was kicked in the head by a horse. It was bad. And uh, Grandfather knew he needed a doctor real quick. There were no telephones, no emergency squad. He was on his own. The only thing to do was to drive his buggy to town, Merchantville, and bring the doctor back. And he knew if he drove his horse hard that far and back again, he could ruin him. And he wouldn't do that for the world. But he knew his priorities, so he drove his horse hard. He brought the doctor back, but it did ruin the horse. The man survived, but he had a bad head, in head injury and was never able to work again. And mother said they kept him in their home, cared for him. She couldn't remember how long. She was very young at the time. It may not have been for the rest of his life, but certainly for a time. There was no Social Security then, no SSI, and there may not have been any kind of workman's compensation. On some farms, a man in that situation would have been turned out. But on many farms, they felt a real responsibility to their people and care for them. 
a married man living in a house, if he was sick for a while, like Thomas Cunningham was, he would continue to have the house without charge and products from the farm. A single man living living in the main house, if, if he was sick, he'd be treated as one of the family. Now, Martha, she may have written uh, letters herself. You don't have them. But occasionally, she would add something to Emma's letter. And she wrote, I want thee to be a good boy and always try to do what is right and never allow any feelings to find a place in my breast, but that would meet thy heavenly Father's approval. For truly to be good is to be happy. Preach it, he will say. But remember, it is only thy mother's love and anxiety for her dear boy. Newspapers, Emma got a weekly paper from Mount Holly. There were, had to be at least a couple of daily papers in Philadelphia. But newspapers weren't timely enough for death notices. So when somebody died, a notice was printed up and they were hand delivered to, to the appropriate people. <clears throat> in a letter written June 8, 1877, he tells of returning from the sale of timber in the cedar swamp and the pines and says, on our road, we passed through several places where the locusts were exceeding thick, often several on a single leaf. They kept the constant low singing, making a noise which we will be likely, not be likely soon to forget, not loud but peculiar. The laurels are in full bloom and made a display almost equal to the rhododendrons at the centennial. I sold our wool to Thomas Wilson this afternoon, twice 35 cents per pound for clean wool or about a dollar twenty per cheap. I believe that our friends and neighbors are generally well, and I see that while I have been writing, my mother has fallen fast asleep, so she will not send her love. But the always has it, he may rest assured together with great solicitude for thy well-being. The letter ended, as they all did, affectionately thy father, I'm a Robert. And since Israel graduated from Swarthmore the following week, he turned home, so ended the letter. But I appreciate this opportunity to share these letters to help us to better understand and appreciate the lives, the efforts, and the time for those who preceded it. Thank you. Thank you. They gave me some directions on how to grow apples, and I, I made a living on them. <laughs> and I'm, I, I wish I'd had that before while I was still born. <laughs> but oh, this, this really nice. Really nice. Oh, thanks very much. Hey, <laughs> my, this looks real nice, except for the picture of me down there. <laughs> <laughs> it's a thanks very much. Thank you very much, dear. <laughs> <laughs>